Manchuria was the ethnic homeland of the ruling Manchu nobles of the Qing dynasty. When the Qing Empire became the Republic of China after the 1911 revolution, Manchuria became three provinces of the new republic. The old Manchurian capital of Mukden is today's Shenyang. In the 1920s, Shenyang was the capital of Fangtian. Last episode, I briefly mentioned the Fangtian clique. It was named for the warlords from that northeast part of China. Their leader was Zhang Zolin. He had been a mischievous child named Pimple. By the 1920s, after the Anfu Jirli War in 1920, he controlled Manchuria, Inner Mongolia, and was a participant in the government in Beijing. He had also become very wealthy. How did this pimple grow so large? Manchuria had been hotly contested during the late Qing dynasty. Both Japan and Russia were interested and had occupied it. Japan had temporarily taken possession during the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 1895. The Empress Dowager's government had then granted a lease at the strategic port of Dalian to Russia, which called it Port Arthur. Japan then took Port Arthur during its successful war with Russia in 1904 and 1905, and had kept it since then. Why was Manchuria so desirable? It had good farmland, which grew wheat, millet, sorghum, and soya beans. It was also rich in coal and iron ore. Food and minerals were key resources, and especially desirable to industrializing and expansionary Japan. Duan Chi Rei had allowed Japanese troops to be stationed in Manchuria and Inner Mongolia during the First World War, as part of his agreements with Japan that led to him being called a traitor by his opponents. Zhang Zuo Lin was born in 1875. As a youth, he enjoyed fishing, fighting, and gambling. He had worked as a waiter and caring for horses at an inn. He would have been 19 years old when Japan attacked China and took control of Manchuria for a while. The next year, in 1896, Zhang joined a well-known bandit gang. During the Boxer Rebellion, the Qing army absorbed this bandit group. Zhang then escorted traveling merchants. When Japan and Russia were at war, fighting in Manchuria, Zhang supported the Asian-Japanese side. He then became a cavalryman who did border patrols and bandit suppression activities. If you're surprised that a bandit joined the army and then suppressed bandits, I would encourage you to listen to the last episode when I discussed how bandits and soldiers worked symbiotically. Zhang is a case in point. By the end of the Qing Empire, he led a considerable number of men. When the 1911 Chinese Revolution came, Manchurians faced some difficult choices. Their royal family abdicated. Some commanders wanted to declare independence. The governor, a Qing loyalist, used Zheng and others to keep control and set up a Manchurian People's Peacekeeping Council. At its first meeting, the governor was shouted down by a revolutionary. Zhang and his men then brandished their pistols, and the meeting ended. The governor was then able to establish the council with himself as the head, and without pesky revolutionaries disturbing it. He appointed Zhang as vice minister of military affairs. Zhang had 2,500 men come into the regional capital to keep order for the governor. The revolution was set back by his efforts. Zhang's loyalty and show of force was rewarded, and his military career advanced. He was granted noble titles by the Qing near the very end of their empire. But once it seemed like Yuan Shikai would take the presidency, Zhang allied himself with this head of the Beiyang army in 1912. Zhang had a knack for picking the side that was going to win. He had done it with Japan against Russia, he repeated it by siding with Yuan Shikai. We'll see it again, too. 
Zheng sent Yuan a huge and precious ginseng root, expressing their close relations. Zheng murdered some revolutionaries in Manchuria. In June 1912, the Mukden garrison revolted because of a shortage of supplies and general dissatisfaction. Tokyo threatened to intervene and send troops. Zheng was able to restore order in the provincial capital. Yuan Shikai was impressed and promoted him to lieutenant general and renamed Zheng's troops the 7th Division. Japan still controlled the port at Dalian, also known as Port Arthur, and an area of about 3,400 square kilometers. They also controlled the South Manchurian Railway. Zheng built good relations with them. Yun praised Zheng for his bandit suppressing activities, but was also wary of him. He tried to transfer Zheng to Mongolia. But Zheng sent a refusal by telegram, reminding Yuan that it was Zheng who kept order in northeast China, while Yuan had needed to quash the 1913 Second Revolution down south. When Yuan Shikai was inquiring about becoming emperor, he solicited feedback. The official commander-in-chief of Fangtian province was asked, and advised Yuan to think about it a little more. Yuan didn't like that, and transferred him out. But instead of promoting Zhang, Yuan brought in another loyalist to govern all three Manchurian provinces. Zhang played it diplomatically, made a big show of welcoming his new boss, while also sending a telegram to Yuan in Beijing to confirm his loyalty. When Yuan became emperor, he awarded Zhang the title of Marquis, second class. Zhang had no formal education and was unsure of the rank. He asked around and was told it wasn't very high, and the Chinese term included the character for son, suggesting that Yuan considered him like a son or child. In the Confucian system, that'd mean that Yuan expected loyalty from Zhang, as a father expects it from his son. Zhang was not impressed, but bided his time. Yuan's efforts to become emperor caused rebellion in South China, and Zhang used this to further grow his position in the Northeast. In March 1916, when Yuan was distracted by the rebellion to his new dynasty, Zhang expelled the military governor. Zhang had the support of Japanese military commanders when he did it. Yuan accepted it as a fait accompli and appointed him as superintendent of military affairs in Fengtian province. When Yuan died, Zhang assumed the provincial civil governorship, and from then on was both military and civilian governor in that province. Zhang had become the warlord of Fengtian by 1916. He allowed Japan to increase its access to resources and markets. His opposition to the revolutionaries in the south and his independence from Beijing suited Japan's preferences for its then divide-and-conquer strategy in China. Zhang's next big chance was in 1917, when there was that brief restoration of the Manchu dynasty in Beijing. Zhang was non-committal, but once it failed, he turned it to his advantage. One of Zhang's subordinates had previously plotted against Zhang and had been implicated in the restoration. Zhang was able to imprison him, fire him, and absorb his soldiers. Then in August 1917, the northernmost Heilongjiang province had a rebellion. The local governor fled, and Zhang assumed warlord power there too. Then two months later, he was able to manipulate Beijing to dismiss the warlord of Jilin province, who had been implicated in the Manchu restoration bid. So by October 1917, Zhang gained the other two provinces in Manchuria and was civilian and military governor of all three provinces. He was now on top of all of Manchuria, except for the parts controlled by Japan. Premier Tuan Chi Rei tried to get Zhang's support for his Anfu clique. Zhang was told that a shipload of Japanese arms, enough to equip seven brigades, perhaps 10,000 soldiers, was in a port just a few kilometers outside Zhang's province of Fangtian, in the direction of Tianjin. Zhang sent some officials to investigate. It was confirmed, and they took control of the shipment. Zhang then showed his appreciation 
by lending Duan 50,000 troops for the campaign against southern China. Beijing rewarded him with the title of Inspector of the Three Provinces in the Northeast. But by 1919, tensions were growing between Zhang and Duan Shi Rei. Duan's campaign in the south wasn't going well. Zhang had not been much help there. And Zhang was upset that Beijing had appointed Duan's right-hand man to control the old imperial holdings in Chengdu, where the imperial family had its hunting lodge, and where they had retreated during the Second Opium War. That was just outside of Zhang's area of control, and that other commander was also given control of what is now Inner Mongolia and Ningxia. So just before the outbreak of war between the Anfu and Zhili cliques, Zhang was upset with the Anfu leader over this slight. In March 1920, Zhang invited representatives of eight provinces, including Zhili, to his headquarters to discuss an alliance against the Anfu group. The Chinese president also invited Zhang down to Beijing to act as a mediator between the two sides. Zhang took an armored train down to Beijing, mounted with machine guns and with two whole battalions of guards. An American writer wrote about that trip. He expected a fierce, uncouth, primitive creature from the north. Instead, he was surprised to meet a slender, delicate, little person wearing subdued silks with soft hands and soft-spoken. I posted a photo of Zhang with this episode. Zhang had an English-speaking official with him, but Zhang spoke directly without evasion. For instance, when talking about a regiment that had mutinied, he recommended executing them all. One outcome of the trip, Zhang was able to get the Beijing government to dismiss Duan Chirei's right-hand man as governor of those areas that Zhang coveted outside Manchuria. But then Zhang understood he would be poisoned at his next dinner and abruptly left for Manchuria. Only once he was safely back home did he send a telegram saying that in the future he would mediate with military force. All prepared for war, which came in July 1920. I discussed it last episode. Zhang supported Wu Peifu in the Juli side by placing a large army on its side, but without committing them. They had avoided losses, and now both Zhang and Wu Peifu's forces occupied Beijing. The Fengtian clique captured a lot of military spoils and needed 100 railway cars to transport them to its territory. They also captured 12 aircraft, which were sent north. Julie and Feng Tian's soldiers were trying to outdo each other, looting Anfu supplies. At one time, Julie troops had confiscated two searchlights. Zhang insisted that his Feng Tian clique receive them. As a result, Cao Kun, the official leader of the Julie clique, replied that Zhang is really abandoned. He's got so much stuff already, and he still wants those searchlights. Zhang also recruited among the defeated Anfu soldiers. When the new joint Feng Tian Zhili government was introduced, Zhang invited Japanese journalists to Tianjin, where he promised mutual collaboration with Japan, and that he would try to improve Japanese-Chinese relations. The Japanese responded favorably and supported him. The new government in Beijing appointed Zhang to lead those commissioner posts in the former imperial hunting grounds, as well as in Inner Mongolia and in Ningxia. Zhang now controlled a huge landmass that wrapped around Beijing to the west, northwest, north, and northeast. It did not have a huge population, but it had plenty of resources in the territory. Zhang's growth in status, power, and wealth would have been difficult to imagine during the Qing dynasty. The breakdown of the imperial system allowed this street fighter to rise virtually to the top of China. Duan Chirei, meanwhile, went to the Japanese consulate in Tianjin and asked for sanctuary. Zhang was not satisfied with being the leader of the North. He wanted to control Beijing too. He arranged for a change of premier without the approval of the Julie clique. 
that new cabinet then denied the Julie group money that had been promised. Julie then retaliated and got the pro Fangtiang premier to resign after only a month. Then the conflict moved to the battlefield. War was declared between the two brief coalition partners in April 1922. Each side had about 100,000 soldiers in the field, with Zheng's Fangtian clique probably having a small numerical advantage. Wu Peifu was again commander-in-chief of the Julie forces. Zheng was head commander of his side, and he led his troops on the eastern side of Beijing. Wu Peifu personally guided his side west of Beijing. Like in the Anfu Julie War, at first the Julie troops were forced back, this time by Fengtian troops in the west. Manchurian shells kept the Julie troops from regaining ground. Then Julie artillery responded, and it was a stalemate in the west. Then Wu Peifu's brilliance shone again. His side was able to outflank the Fengtian rear. Its 16th division then defected to Julie. The Fengtian western side retreated before attempting a counterattack. Wu faked a retreat, which overstretched the Manchurians as they advanced. It was an ambush. The Julie troops outflanked them and achieved complete victory. The Fengtian Western Front was completely annihilated. Now, Julie army could concentrate in the east. The Manchurians under Zhang had been doing better on that front and had initially been successful. But news from the west bolstered the morale of the Juli side and gave them reinforcements. Zheng Zuolin ordered a retreat of the troops he personally commanded. His son, Zhang Shui Liang, led a fighting retreat and escaped with minor casualties. However, a third part of the Fangtian side initially had successes and had moved forward, but renewed Juli forces scored a victory. And as these Manchurian troops were retreating, they were exposed to 20,000 Western Juli soldiers, reinforcing by train. Now outmatched, the Manchurians were defeated, and the leftovers retreated further. The Fengtian side suffered about 20,000 dead, 10,000 desertions, and lost 40,000 troops as prisoners or by surrender. Clearly, the Fengtian clique had lost this war against Zhe Li in 1922. The British helped mediate a peace, whereby Zheng would retreat his forces northeast into Manchuria, and Zhe Li would not pursue them. Zheng lost control of those lands outside Manchuria, and Zhe Li was in charge of administration in Beijing. Zheng lived to see another day in his autonomous fiefdom, and he planned to rebuild his forces he would want revenge. By now, however, a new force was emerging. The Russian Civil War was concluding, and both the Red Army and leftovers of the White Army were eyeing China. And a new political party had been founded. Please join us next time as communism comes to China. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Chinese Revolution.